Uncle Scar. When I'm king, what'll that make you? A monkey's uncle. <laughs> You're so weird. You have no idea. Now, Scar is uh, Mufasa's brother, evil brother. The king always has an evil brother. And so does the hero. The hero always has an adversary. And the reason for that is the king always has an evil brother. And that means that the state always has a tyrannical element. And the tyrannical element exists for two reasons. One is the state deteriorates of its own accord. And that's an entropy observation. What that means is that the state is a construction of the past, right? But the present isn't the same as the past. And to the degree that the past is mismatched with the demands of the present, then it's, then it's, then it's uh, tyrannical. It's malfunctioning. And so it's, it's a continual problem with the state. It's always two steps behind the environment. And so then, that means that the awareness of living people has to update the state. Anyway, Scar is scarred, right? So what that implies is he's had a pretty rough life and he's kind of skinny and he said he was born in the low end of the gene pool and so he has reasons to be resentful. He's also hyper intelligent and rational and it's one of the things you see very commonly about the evil adversary of the state or of the individuals, often intelligent and hyper rational. And um, the best commentator on that was probably John Milton in Paradise Lost because that's how he represents Lucifer or Satan, who's the spirit of rationality and enlightenment, strangely enough, hence Lucifer, the bringer of light. And the reason for that, as far as I can tell, and this is something that Milton figured out when he compiled all these ancient stories about evil and tried to make them coherent, was that the problem with irrationality, with rationality, is that it tends to fall in love with its own productions. Right, and so then it comes up with a theory and it makes that a totality and then it won't let go. So the rational mind has a totalitarian element. And we know that to some degree because that kind of rationality seems more left hemisphere focused and the left hemisphere tends to impose structured order on the world and be updated by the right hemisphere. And the right hemisphere generally updates it with negative information and with fantasy. And so the left hemisphere will impose a coherent structure on the world, which is really necessary for you to live in it. But the problem is there's a tension between coherence and completeness. And that's partly why you need two hemispheres. You need one to represent the world and you need one to keep track of the exceptions and to feed those slowly into the representational system so that it, so that it can stay updated without collapsing into complete chaos. So anyways, SCAR, and he's, he's got this like droopy mouth and this whiny, arrogant voice and he feels hard done by and he's resentful. And, and in, in classic hero stories, uh, stories of the state as well, the, so this is an Egyptian take on it, Osiris was, was the god of the state and Set, who later became Satan, that name became Satan as it transformed through Coptic Christianity. Um, Osiris had a brother named Set and Set, he, he didn't pay attention to Set, enough attention. And Set was always scheme, scheming to overthrow the kingdom, just like Scar is. And uh, the Egyptians said straightforwardly that the reason that Osiris got overthrown by Set, he got chopped into pieces and his pieces distributed throughout the state in the mythological representation. And those pieces were actually the provinces of Egypt, technically speaking, so, and, and that's what the Egyptians thought, so that's quite cool. But the Egyptians said explicitly that the reason that Osiris got overthrown by Set was because he was willfully blind. Old, senile, and willfully blind. Same idea as the flood myth. You don't see that quite here because Mufasa is sort of on to Set or to Scar, but Scar is more treacherous than Mufasa believes and he gets at, he gets at uh, Mufasa by going through his son, by, by, by playing on the, on the impulsivity and, and juvenile qualities of his son. And so, Obviously, there's some antagonism between these two, as you can see by their facial expressions there. And uh, there's the good example of Scar. You know, he's got that droopy, kind of whiny, malevolent face and that malevolent voice that Jeremy Irons pulls off so incredibly well. And uh, he's, he's always skulking. He's a creature of the night. He always skulks around. He's not a creature of the day in any sense of the word. And, you know, obviously, uh, Mufasa is golden like the sun and, and Scar is dark like the night. Now. At this point, Simba also gets introduced to Scar, and that, that, that has two meanings. One is that Scar is the tyrannical element of the state, and so as a child, when you're being socialized, you encounter the tyranny of the state, and one of the best, you can't, there's no way around it. 
one of the best examples of that is that children are always running around having fun and they're really bubbly and, and uh, impulsive and, and joyous and playful. And that causes a lot of trouble because positive emotion is very disruptive. They'll run around and break things, and they'll hurt themselves and they'll get into trouble. And so you're always saying, calm down, sit down, behave, don't do that. And it's, it's not because they're crying or angry, it's because they're so damn happy and impulsive that no one can stand them. And so, and so that's a tyranny. It's like the, the state puts, puts pressure on you to regulate your emotions, positive, negative, and positive. And it crushes you. It crushes the life out of you, a lot of it. And so you end up, you know, your age and you're all mopey because the whole, especially because you've been forced to sit down in school for like 17 years. You're all mopey and it's no wonder, you know, you've had the spirit taken out of you by the process of discipline. But without that, you'd be completely useless. So it's another one of those paradoxical, you know, gifts and, and catastrophes that you encounter as you move through life. So anyways, Simba, look at how happy he is, you know. I mean, he doesn't know a damn thing. He's so naive, you can tell by, oh, look, it's my Uncle Scar. It's like, you know, and this is not a guy you smile at, clearly, but he's all positive emotion and joy and enthusiasm, and that's not good because that means this character can take serious advantage of it, and that's exactly what he does. And so Scar pretends to be on his side, which is what a good pedophile always does, by the way. And so, you know, you, you take advantage of the child's trusting nature and openness in order to exploit them, and that's, that's what horrible people do that all the time, including the parents of children and other children themselves. So, you know, there's this false, I mean, look at the animators are so damn brilliant, eh? Look at that expression. <laughs> really, like, you know, you just look at that and you think, well, that's just a facial expression, but of course it's not. Some damn animators worked on really hard to get that. They're really observant and they distill the facial, ex look how big the face is, right? It covers the whole head. And, and they, they've got the eyebrow lifts proper and they've got this horrible sanctimonious smile and the tilt of the head and, you know, and he's sort of crushing him while he's hugging him at the same time. And really, really. And, you know, it, it took a lot of thought for every single one of these frames to be put together, right? There's a tremendous amount of cognitive effort that went into that. So none of this is accidental. Yeah, well, that pretty much says everything. It's like, I hate that kid and can hardly wait till he's gone. And didn't I pull one over on him, you know? It's a real testament to an adult's genius when he can fool a kid. <laughs>